thank you for coming. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with Apache Storm? Okay, awesome. So when I was first thinking about a title for this presentation, I tried to think of the most mundane thing you could connect to the internet, to internet enable. And the first thing I thought of was a toaster. Um, little did I know, someone had already done that. Um, there's a Twitter account for my toaster, um, and it's basically a hardware hack that turns a toaster into a sensor, connects it to the, to the internet, and uses the Twitter API to uh, tweet its status when it's toasting or finished toasting. Um, it's pretty cool from a hacker perspective, but is it, is it lucrative? Probably not. I, I can think of many ways to make, or perhaps more importantly, save um, money based on remotely monitoring the status of a toaster. Um, but in reality, that's not the point. The, the point is that it's becoming increasingly easy to network or internet-enable devices as mundane as a, a toaster. And it's not a stretch of the imagination um, to apply the idea to business use cases. And when you consider that at scale, there's a tremendous amount of business opportunity there if you know where to look. Um, Gartner predicts that by 2020 there will be 26 billion IOT devices connected to the internet. That's a lot of devices generating a lot of data. To put that in perspective, that's over five and a half times the size of the entire IPv4 address space. That's big. Sensors are everywhere today. Um, I'd wager to guess that Everyone in here has a load of sensors in your pocket. Um, if you have a phone, um, it's full of sensors. Um, there's GPS, proximity sensors, um, Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of people ask me why I consider Wi-Fi a sensor. Um, if you think of anyone, or if you ask anyone in the um, security industry, um, a network card is definitely can be considered a sensor. Um, and even user interface. Um, so when you click on a button, um, you're interacting essentially with a virtual sensor. Even in your car. Um, nowadays, there, there are almost as many sensors in a, a modern car as there are in um, airplanes, you know, a decade ago or so. Um, and this is the the Google self-driving car. Um, and anything autonomous, whether it's a car, a drone, or a robot, requires sensors um, to detect and react to the environment in which it operates. And even on your wrist, does anyone have a Fitbit or some kind of wearable that they use? No? OK. Um, but this is a jawbone. Um, and if you skin the jawbone and look inside of it, it's really just a collection of sensors um, that detect what your body is doing, what you are doing, whether you're asleep or awake. Um, which brings me to this. This is an interesting um, case that in 2014 there was a in California there was a an earthquake that happened in the middle of the night. And um, some of the data analysts at Jawbone um, looked at the data they had during that time period and correlated a spike in um, people being awake or waking up in response to the earthquake. And then you can also see how um, distance away from the epicenter affected how whether people were awake or not. Um, and I, I should also point out that the earthquake woke people up. The earthquake wasn't caused by people waking up. Um, sensors. So, so what is a sensor? Um, Wikipedia has a, a fairly technical definition of a, a sensor. Um, but in other words, a sensor detects properties of the physical environment 
and converts them into something we can measure. Um, the simplest sensor is a button or switch, um, which is either pressed or not, or on or off, and you can look at the status of that um, and react to it. Um, but of course, there, there are tons of different types of sensors. Um, there are sensors that can measure pressure. There are sensors that can um, detect when, something, when a piece of material bends or something. Um, used in, like if you've seen um, glove controllers for video games, that sort of thing. Um, environmental sensors. So here are a couple sensors. Um, one is a, a light sensor, and the one in the upper right-hand corner is a soil pH and moisture sensor. Um, and then there's a um, proximity motion detecting sensor um, down the corner. Um, and if, if you think about it, use your imagination a little bit, you could combine these sensors for something like an agricultural use case. Um, light and soil conditions, that sort of thing. Um, Another example, here's a uh, temperature and humidity sensor and an anemometer that measures um, wind speed, and then a Geiger counter. Um, so again, if you use your imagination, you could probably combine these for a use case that maybe detects radiation leaks and based on um, weather conditions can um, help predict how the plume of radiation will travel. So let's look at some IoT use cases. In my mind, um, successfully leveraging sensors in an IoT application involves three things. Detecting, anticipating, and reacting. Um, anticipating is where predictive analytics comes into play. That's probably a term that you've heard a lot while you've um, been attending various presentations at this conference. So. You detect behavior, anticipate or predict behavior, and then react to that behavior. Um, so let's look at a couple cases of um, how that can come into play in the real world. Um, hotel room monitoring and automation. Um, this probably doesn't apply to um, a, a small, something small like a bed and breakfast, but if you consider a large-scale hotel chain with um, hotels across the world, many, many thousands of rooms, um, think about how much they could save even if they, if they could turn off the heat or stop cooling a room that's unoccupied. Um, so in that case, they detect occupancy, anticipate occupancy, and react to that occupancy. Um, and that has the potential to um, benefit the customer experience. Um, so if you imagine, um, let's say you have your, your phone, some kind of app on your phone, and um, you check in remotely with your phone, and based on your GPS location, it realizes that you're coming back to the hotel and are likely to go to your room, and you've pre-set up a, a preference of what you want the temperature to be in your room. And the hardware in the hotel will automatically turn on the heat or turn on the air conditioning, um, and the room will be the perfect temperature for you when you arrive there. Um, so that benefits the user. And then from the, um, for the hotel chain, that gives them all sorts of data about their, their customers and their customers' behavior um, that they can analyze and um, predict and learn more and more about their customers. Um, another use case is a um, auto lube, like a, a Jiffy Lube, um, essentially a service station that changes oil and stuff. So they need to manage inventory in response to demand. So they detect their current levels of inventory using sensors, anticipate customer demand, and then react accordingly. So in this case, they have um, storage tanks with 
um, motor oil in it and um, antifreeze. And attached to them, they have um, wireless sensors attached to wireless transmitters that monitor the levels of um, oil and antifreeze and then transmit that to a central computer that um, analyzes it and predicts when they need to um, order additional inventory um, and can do that on demand as they, they need it rather than um, stockpile more inventory than they actually need. Another case is hospital infection control. Um, in the United States, the CDC estimates that hospital-acquired infections cost about $30 billion a year and lead to um, over 100,000 patient deaths. And the main cause of that is inadequate hand washing um, and hygiene. So in that case, and uh, there are actually a number of um, companies and hospitals actually doing this, um, they use sensor networks to ensure that the, the staff properly um, washes their hands. So in this case, they'll detect whether, they'll detect when a um, hospital personnel has entered a, a patient room and then anticipate that that nurse or that healthcare practitioner has to wash their hands and then react to um, whether they, they practice proper hygiene. So in that case, the sensors involved might be a RFID chip. So you have a nurse wearing some kind of tag so they know who entered the room, um, a motion detector on the bottom right um, so they know that that person actually went into the room, they didn't just open and close the door, and then a momentary switch on the soap dispenser um, and maybe a um, water flow detector to make sure they used hot water and washed their hands long enough. Um, in auto insurance, um, a lot of auto insurance companies are rethinking traditional risk assessment. Um, a good example of that is young male drivers. Um, young male drivers are traditionally flagged as, high, as the highest risk, and that model tends to punish young males who are actually very good drivers. Um, they just traditionally have been lumped into one group. Um, but insurance companies are part starting to put sensors um, in cars that detect unsafe driving practices or safe driving practices um, and predict who is most at risk and then react to that risk assessment. So based on sensors in the car, they can determine if you are a high-risk driver or a low-risk driver and then um, price your insurance policy accordingly. Those are just a, a few fairly obvious use cases, um, but really if you use your imagination and look at what kind of sensors are out there, um, there are all sorts of different things that you can come up with. So what you need to, to think about is how you can combine sensors, whether they're in an, in an existing device like, like a phone or a wearable um, or a, uh, something in the home like a uh, Nest thermostat, um, there's also, um, I forget the name of it, but it monitors the, the various environmental aspects of your home. Um, but using that, figure out how sensors can better serve your needs and also the needs of your users and customers. How many people in the audience have heard of Arduino or know what it is? Awesome. Um, so then, you pro this probably sounds familiar, Arduino is an open source electronics platform that's based on easy to use hardware and software. Um, it's open source um, and it's really geared towards prototyping. So you use Arduino to uh, prototype, you can plug in sensors and run some, some basic um, software on the microcontroller. Um, and it's physical computing. So it's, it bridges that gap between software and the physical world, um, interacting with the environment. Um, it's, a lot of people tend to compare it to the Raspberry Pi. 
um, and they're similar and the, the gap is, is narrowing. Um, but an Arduino is a, strictly a microcontroller, um, at least for now it's starting to um, go into the territory of Raspberry Pi. Um, but the difference is with a Raspberry Pi, it has a full, a Raspberry Pi has a full-blown processor on it and you can run an operating system. Um, whereas with Arduino, you run simpler microcontroller applications. Um, Arduino comes in multiple form factors. Um, the big photograph is an Arduino Uno. Um, that's sort of the de facto Arduino that people prototype with, but they come in um, even smaller ones, like ones the size of a quarter that you can embed in, in something wearable um, for prototypes. And um, on the right there at the bottom is a Arduino lily pad. And that's for embedding into to clothing and wearables, that sort of thing. Um, this is the physical layout of an, of an Arduino. Um, there are digital inputs and digital outputs, and then analog inputs and analog outputs. Those pins allow you to connect to multiple sensors and um, outputs such as lights, LEDs, um, LCD displays, that sort of thing. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, sort of, com when you compare Arduino to Raspberry Pi, is the um, the existence of both three volt and five volt output um, sensors. Different sensors use different voltages. Um, Arduino lets you use either or, um, so that helps a lot. Whereas I believe I don't think Raspberry Pi does that yet. Um, programming in Arduino. Um, this is a Arduino programs are called sketches. Um, there's an official Arduino IDE that's written in Java, so it's cross-platform. Um, you program it with uh, basically C and C++ uh, that also has some sy syntactic sugar on top of it. Um, programs are referred to as sketches, and um, most of the sensors that you find out there on websites like Adafruit and that sort of thing um, have libraries on GitHub that make them very easy to use. You don't have to know the, the low-level details of what's going on in that sensor. And this sketch, um, that's a simple sketch and the corresponding wiring um, for a simple Hello World application that, that blinks an LED on and off. Then how do you create sensor networks um, with Arduino? Um, one option is XB, which is a wireless protocol um, and hardware device that lends itself very well to Arduino because it uses it only uses two wires, so you only need two pins on your Arduino to use it, and it's essentially um, serial communication. So to write something over the network, over the wireless network, it's essentially a print statement, and that text will travel across the network. XBs allow you to, um, they're radio modules that support wireless point-to-point -point communication. Um, I mentioned it was serial, and minimal connections are required. And they come in two forms, or two power options, um, one for uh, several hundred feet, and then the, the higher power option, um, higher power version can um, transmit um, on the order of kilometers. And there's support with XB for um, multiple types of topo network topologies like mesh, star, and tree, and several others. So how does that fit into a architecture for um, dealing with large scale, large amounts of um, sensor data? Typically, you would have a, a sensor hardware um, with XB Arduino, and you may prototype with Arduino, and then once you have your prototype done, have a manufacturer actually build the real thing uh, so you don't have wires sticking out all over the place. Um, when you have s sensors, 
uh, like a sensor network, you would probably use a um, what I call a collector, and in this case, that would be something more substantial like a Raspberry Pi. So you would have your two gigahertz um, XP protocol going to a Raspberry Pi that receives the raw data, um, adds a timestamp, because microcontrollers, that's another difference between um, Raspberry Pi and Arduino, is microcontrollers don't have a real-time clock by default, but you can add one. Um, but a Raspberry Pi does, so there you would collect the data coming from the sensors, add the timestamp, and then publish them to a reliable queue. Um, in this case, Kafka, and then attached to Kafka, um, you would use Storm for your analytics, persistence, and alerting. So why, why use Apache Storm? Um, for one, speed. Um, processing streaming data in real time, scalability and fault tolerance, and flexibility. Um, Storm has APIs for processing single events and also doing micro batch and transactional processing. And that gives you the option to choose the latency and throughput balance that is best for your use case. So with certain IoT use cases, low latency can be essential. And Storm gives you a number of options in terms of balancing throughput, um, throughput and latency. Whereas some other um, streaming platforms don't. They, they force you into a specific model um, that may be microbatch only, that sort of thing. And why Kafka? Um, for its, it's a distributed, reliable PubSub event queue. Um, and one of the best features of it, I think, is that it allows consumers to rewind to specific points in time and start replaying messages. So that can be very important um, in terms of fault tolerance and re guaranteed reliability. Um, and Kafka, com when combined with Storm, provides everything Storm needs for exactly once and at least once. Um, processing guarantees. So if we go back to um, maybe the, the hotel room application, a typical architecture might look like this. So z the two zones might be different floors on the hotel, and your, your sensors are publishing to a collector. The collector aggregates to Kafka and then goes to Storm for um, real-time analytics. Then on the analytics side, that's where you, have, where you would do your um, receive data from Kafka, do your real-time batch and interactive processing, um, and use Storm to push that data to um, stores like HDFS, HBase, Hive, uh, relational databases, that kind of thing, and then um, do your batch and interactive processing on top of that. Um, I should probably make the obligatory reference to Lambda architecture here, um, but I, I generally tell people to be careful with that. The, the Lambda architecture is not a one-size-fits-all, um, and it may not suit your use case. Um, after all, the Lambda architecture is just a, an architectural design pattern, and there are other patterns um, that can better suit your use cases. So. Pick the best one that, that works for your use case. So once the data enters Storm, you usually have a Storm component like a bolt that would persist the raw and intermediate data for batch interactive flows and views. Um, and then in the real-time analytics, that's where your detect, anticipate, and react flows go. And that's also where you feed your model. And your model may, may be an actual uh, machine learning model, or it may be um, publishing, populating lookup tables, that sort of thing. A lot of people ask, where do I put the smarts? Do you, do you put the logic in the IoT device, or do you put it in the analytics layer? So why would you put it near the edge? 
um, if it's required for user experience. So if the device you have has a user interface, then it's going to have to have logic to interact with the user. Um, collaboration, if devices need to talk to one another in a network. Um, bandwidth limitations and storage limitations. But why wouldn't you put it near the edge? Um, updating hardware is hard, really hard. If you make a mistake with the hardware and need to push a new version out, that gets expensive. And updating firmware in the field is almost as hard. And there's a good chance you might get it wrong the first time. And then what do you do? So again, why not put it near the edge? Save everything because you're going to make mistakes. Um, weave yourself a safety net and use batch processing to correct the errors. So save all the data because storage is cheap. And you can't analyze data that you don't have. So now I'm, I'll switch over to a demo. Um, the, the Twitter line right there is a hint. Um, the hardware that I use in the demo I'm going to give away, so take that into consideration. Um, originally, I was thinking about um, using something like XMPP um, for alerting in the demo, but in homage to the tweeting toaster, I'm going to use Twitter instead. So our fictional use case begins here at the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant. <laughs> As you may know, the safety inspector for S Sector 7Gs is not well known for his reliability and work ethic. And regrettably, there have been a number of accidents involving the release of nuclear material. And unfortunately, that has led to this. While local, local government has dismissed the issue, federal inspectors have mandated improved safety measures. Um, so this is an Arduino Explora. Um, I chose this because um, typically a, a regular Arduino doesn't have any, um, any sensors attached, but the Arduino Explora is sort of modeled as a video game controller and it has a joystick, it's got an, an accelerometer on it, a microphone, um, temperature sensor, um, and today we're going to use the linear potentiometer, which is essentially just a slide switch, and that's going to um, simulate the Geiger counter in uh, Sector 7G. Um, I also chose the Explora because I had to get on an airplane, and Arduino prototypes tend to have that time bomb kind of look um, <laughs> that, I, that I don't think airport security would appreciate. Um, this is the sketch that I'm going to load onto this. Um, all it really does is begin serial communication um, and then read all the sensor values and dump them out to the serial port. Um, if we were doing wireless, that would, we'd just be writing to a serial port that represents the XB and write it over um, the wireless network. So very simple sketch. Um, the serial monitor, um, that's another component that's going to be running on my laptop. Um, all it does is read the data that came off of the Arduino, adds a timestamp, um, adds a unique identifier for the device, in this case, um, Sector 7G, so we know where the, the sensor is, and then publishes it to Kafka. So this is what the um, radiation leak topology looks like. We've got the raw sensor data um, coming out of Kafka as JSON, um, a simple parse bolt that extracts the required fields, um, a threshold bolt that evaluates a threshold, whether it's um, passed above a certain threshold, and then when it comes back down below that threshold, and then an alert bolt that raises hell, saying something's wrong, in this case, tweeting it. I need to switch over here. So this is the, um, so right now there's nothing loaded on the Arduino. Um, it's fresh out of the box. This is the 
sketch that I mentioned. I'm going to upload it to the Arduino. And when it runs, now you'll see when I slide the slider, you see that light sort of change. That's different radiation levels. Um, on the storm side, I need to start up Zookeeper, Kafka. And then this is the data logger. And it's going to ask me which serial port I'm connected to. And now it's logging the data that's coming off that. So if I mess with various things, you'll see the sensor data change. And if I, now I'm going to start up Storm and launch my topology. Takes a little while to start up. And now it's receiving those um, radiation levels. So if I start sliding it up and down, you'll see a change. And And if I, the threshold is 1,000, and I got an alert that it went over and returned to normal. And if I check my Twitter client, we should see. that the radiation level in Sector 7G is returned to normal. So that's the end of my demo. So I promised that I would give away the hardware that I used in the demo um, and mention Twitter and Hadoop Summit. So be the seventh person to retweet the last tweet from the demo to win the um, Arduino. So while everyone's madly trying to retweet that, um, a few resources. Um, you can find Apache Storm. Um, Storm website, Kafka, um, more about Arduino. Adafruit and SparkFun are, are great places to, to look for sensors and all, the, all, all sorts of equipment related to that. Um, also, SparkFun. Um, today, there is a, um, well, first of all, if there are any questions, let me know. Um, and for, go ahead. Yes, you raise your hand. Hello. Uh, you spoke of Kafka as a, a requirement to meet uh, the real-time uh, necessities of a storm. Uh, but, uh, there's Flume also. So I, I just wanted to know if you considered Flume. Uh, and if not, uh, what, are the, what, does, what is the new thing that Kafka is, is bringing? Um, Flume, Flume is sort of log-centric. Um, whereas Kafka is sort of general, um, general use. And I most often see people using Flume to feed Kafka. Um, and Kafka is distributed um, and fault tolerant. Um, so I most often see people using Flume to, to feed Kafka. Um, and Flume doesn't... Um, Flume, there's not a Flume spout for Storm. Um, so, but there's a, a very good, reliable spout for Kafka. So generally, I would recommend going from Flume to Kafka. Thank you. And let me quickly 
figure out who it was. Looks like Volker Jans. Are there any other questions? There you go. Thank Congratulations. You. Yes. Fabricio's slides, or, or maybe you can go back to the previous slide because I didn't get the resources. Excuse me. That's all. There's also, if, if, you have, if you want to learn more about Storm, there's a Birds of a Feather session today at um, 5.30 in Hall 400, and I'd be happy to, to answer any um, general questions you have about Storm, that sort of thing. And I'll also be talking about some upcoming things and some things that I'm working on. Any other questions? In the way back, are you stretching or, or raising your hand? Okay. Thank you very much for, for coming.